this is Joseph Coco. I'm at ALA 2015, the annual conference, on behalf of Becca Hilburn's Art Process blog, Keep on Trucking Natto Soup. If you could introduce yourself, Brian. Hi there, I'm Brian Mayer. I'm a, a, my nine to five, I'm a gaming and library technology specialist, so I work to use kind of modern style board games um, in classrooms and school libraries, engaging kids, and I do game design programs with them as well. Uh, I'm also a game designer um, in nine, non nine to five, um, yeah. and um, this is a giant version of my game, Freedom of the Underground Railroad. Uh, that's out by Academy Games, it came out a couple of years ago. Um, it's a cooperative game for one four players. Um, we're working together as abolitionists, uh, trying to help uh, raise the strength of the abolitionist movement to bring about an end to slavery, while also trying to uh, help slaves as they make their way up to freedom in Canada. And so you're kind of yeah. struggling against uh, the game. Um, trying to kind of achieve your victories while you have a bunch of obstacles that are kind of coming up in your path. Fantastic. Uh, it's pretty heavy stuff. I, I know there's been a few other board games that have uh, dealt with slavery issues and that sort of thing, but um, I was talking to you a, a minute ago just about how you try to imbue story narrative into the gameplay as well. Absolutely. So is yeah. that something that started from the ground up, or you really just began with the mechanics and then slowly said, I could see this being like a slavery based game. Oh no no, it was definitely it came from a thematic space. The kind sure. of the the early seedlings came from kind of two places. One, my work in the classroom and um, card driven historical games and seeing how it draws um, you know players kind of into the history and the places in the event and not only kind of seeing it but um, participating in it you know games are a participatory experience where you're you're exploring you're trying and you're um, seeing how these things all mesh together which gives you a better understanding um, and then the other thing was I saw a designer who's kind of uh, more in the art space called uh, Brenda Braithwright um, okay. husband's uh, uh, John Romero who did the Doom video yeah, games yeah. and all of that and so she does these really interesting kind of uh, very deep emotional experiential things about like the Trail of Tears, the Middle Passage, and she was talking about her game Train, which is about the Holocaust. Yeah. And kind of in summation, she was talking about how games are evolving and, and games are more than what we traditionally thought. Kind of an interesting thing is it's like where graphic novels were 15, 20 years ago, yeah. where, you know, you know, there was that shift from just being light comic Sunday morning kids stuff to um, being these serious really strong, matter. serious yeah. subjects um, and becoming the art form that it is today. And games are kind of at that transition point where they're starting to make that switch. You've got the serious game movement. You've got mainstay games like uh, The Last of Us, The Last of Us, I think it's called, sure. uh, where there's like these deep narratives that you're exploring. So now it's not about points, it's about narrative and stories. And the same thing is kind of happening in the analog space where you're starting to have games that kind of move beyond simply scoring points, but are exploring narrative and story and how to kind of transcend the bits and the elements to create these experiences for players. And part of that is gameplay, part of that is art, part of that is theme, and it all kind of ties together. Okay. And libraries are starting to incorporate um, more board games into their uh, their systems? It's not just like Zarya Monopoly and those sort of things anymore? Yeah, no, exactly. So, I mean, depending on the library type, um, yeah. they have uh, varying different kinds of programs. But yeah, so you still have social engagement programs where you're, you know, you're building community, you're getting people involved. Um, to kind of come together and socialize and get to know each other. But then you also have programs that are leveraging them for education, for growth, for building life skills like financial literacy, uh, working with uh, special needs and special ed populations to do like gross and fine motor skills. Um, so there's, there's a whole host of things that are happening. Um, and, and a lot of times you get outreach to communities where you're doing game design, uh, where you're drawing in and connecting to maker spaces, sure. design programs, connecting with uh, local designers, local artists to come together and do things like that, and reaching out and doing design for the, the community as well, too. So um, there's a great thing that's kind of coming up where you have these little design guilds that are working with local hospitals or local museums or school programs to do kind of design work to build playful and engaging experiences for kind of yeah. those spaces out in the community. Yeah, and maybe even about, like, personal problems related to that community, like if fracking or something is a big issue in that community, they could potentially build 
Absolutely. something to explain exactly what fracking might be to uh, even a layman just through the mechanics of a game. Exactly, yeah. So there, there's, it's a lot of what's next. So, you know, initially it was exploring how just gaming can fit in as a, as a community and an engagement space. And now it's a lot of what are we going to do next with, you know, community outreach and integrating design and all the things we kind of talked about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, so, a, a lot of, I don't know how familiar the audience is with like German strate strategic board games, but the rules for a lot of these games are pretty complex. You can sometimes spend an hour explaining, or sometimes up to three hours, explaining the rules to a new player, um, even if at least one person in the party is familiar with them. So, a lot of times, the first assessment, and for a period of time, of your game is going to be the visuals, the artwork. Yes. Um, the the feel of the pieces, the cards, and that sort of thing. So, obviously, a, I think the most important part of a game is the gameplay mechanics, but you really need to have a good visual setup as well to just draw people in to be interested enough to even give your board game a look. Yeah. Well, I, I'll disagree slightly. I, think, I actually think visuals play a huge role because you can yeah. have... A strong game, but oftentimes if you don't have a strong visual attraction, whether it be the art for the game itself, um, the box cover plays a huge role as well too. Sure. Um, to draw people in, you know, in the store to catch their attention or to draw them into the game. If you have bad art, that can detract from a good game. So finding yeah. the right art, finding that matches quality style-wise, actually can sometimes take an okay game and make it better. So art oftentimes enhances it, and art that is lacking in certain ways or doesn't connect in the right way can actually yeah. detract from the game. Um, and people oftentimes are willing to sit down for longer periods of time with rules if they have it's this beautiful game. looking game yeah. and it looks amazing, the pieces, bits and just things are awesome. While, yeah, exactly. While you're going over the rules. Exactly. And it, it does help sometimes to say like, oh, these this is the money, these are the cubes we're talking about. Mm -hmm. The war units right now, let me show you these individual things. And it can definitely make the process easier if you can communicate yeah. that through. And, and, and you know what, part of that conversation with art is also, um, like, so with my game, I, we wound up working with two artists. <laughs> okay. um, one artist did the cover. Uh, sure. Kind of get a shot. That was an oil painting that was done for the cover. Yeah. Um, and he's out of Hawaii. Uh, the second artist was the artist who took um, my designs, which I did all in Pages and Mac. Um, so sure. I'm, I'm not a strong visual artist, but I'm really good in Pages and Mac and doing layering and um, insta elfing stuff and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, but and taking and translating that into kind of the finished product that you see. And a key part in that, and this is probably something for consideration, is that I cannot, it's not just the, the art and the layout, but it's, it's coming up with strong your iconography, which can be yeah. very difficult. And how can do you translate definitely concepts? Pull in of, some web design into, into that. Yeah, so it, it's a marriage of, of not only knowing about the art, but knowing about iconography, universal design concepts in terms of how can you, because board games have a, have a, a, global, a global community, and so oftentimes a lot of games are language independent, and so, you know, having not only strong artistic skills, but an understanding of kind of universal design principles and iconography and how you can convey actions and things you need to do and clear icons that can speak across languages. Sure. Um, I think those two things are kind of key and important. So when you are when you have a, a design for a game and um, a, a theme for a game, how do you go about uh, seeking out an artist? Do you just have a, a group of people that you regularly work with and say, hey, would you be interested in illustrating this game? Either I might split some of the profits with you or mm -hmm. I'm going to just pay you this much up front. Or for every game, it's a unique sort of style, so you really seek out a different artist for uh, there, every There's game. definitely not a clear answer. Um, okay. It depends on who you are, um, your position, and what you're doing. Getting a game published is hard. So, you sure. know, with the 
the advent and the influx of Kickstarter, which has really kind of revolutionized yeah, kind of the, the, of the game, game publishing process. You know, so you have it where it's much more easier for people to kind of be to independently put out a game without having to wait for a small handful of publishers um, to, to perhaps take interest in their game. That, that's for good and for bad. Um, you know, yeah. there is definitely a reason why there are editors and, mm -hmm. and game publishers and a vetting process and a refinement process to help people get their games a little bit further along. So, I mean, if you're going the independent route, then a lot of times what you're going to be doing is you're going to be reaching out and finding artists. Um, I know a lot of gaming community look to like DeviantArt um, and sure. other places like that to find artists that match their style. Um, yeah. Oftentimes those independent designers don't have the means to come to larger conferences where there is a showcase. They might like um, a great probably resource if you are interested in kind of the, the game design spaces. I know Gen Con is a very nice yeah. artist alley where artists are there showing these are kind of my flash books, my art books of the the different pieces that I have and you'll get a lot of you know that's a much more easily accessible space for kind of up-and-coming designers because yeah. you know a uh, conference badge isn't that much they're there for more than just looking for art they're there to play games and kind of be a part of that experience yeah, so and probably to demo anyway. their stuff yeah they're yeah. gonna go anyway so like something like that you know and trying to find ways if you are interested to kind of showcase to them to kind of be in spaces where they are um, Although, you know, eager people will find out spaces where artists are, and I'm sure there are smaller art shows and things that they, they, they could discover. Sure. Uh, the flip side of that is if you are going to be going the publisher route, then the publisher really has control over the, the kind of where that art goes. So then yeah. that's kind of Lots discovering. Of mm -hmm. to, um, make sure you're on progress and make sure you're fulfilling your contract and yes but and part of it too is that then you know then it's being aware and, and pitching your art and a lot of times artists pitch arts to publishers um, and understanding what I think was important is understanding who the publisher is um, yeah. and publishers oftentimes have a, a style a format a genre of games that they make yeah. and understanding does your art style and, and what you do match or marry with the kinds of games um, that they put out. Now, that's sure. not to say that you don't get variations. A lot of times publishers will uh, push the envelope. For example, Fantasy Flight Games has a very strong fantasy. kind of narrative and fantasy like theme. Tour books but kind of style. Right, yeah. tour books kind of style. But, mm -hmm. you know, like right now they're revisiting Euro games and they're kind of re-putting out some classic Euro games. Yeah. And so kind of having an awareness of what publishers are doing um, is helpful as well too. That sometimes it doesn't hurt to go outside of the normal box because they might be looking at doing a market shift and and um, taking yeah. on new art style and such. So I think it's just awareness of the gaming space and the publishers and the people involved and and um, you know with the gaming it's nice because there's only a couple of big major conventions. You have Gen Con, you have um, Origins, yeah. BGG Con. So you know, if you're interested in kind of making those connections to connect with designers who are being independent or even with publishers, you know, kind of taking advantage of those spaces. Okay. Um, would you have any advice to some to an artist who uh, is considering working for uh, either a designer or a board game publisher? Like, do they need a specific board game type of portfolio or really just any design and illustration um, well, I, mean, I think sufficient? Definitely, you know, just having your, your, your I don't know, from tattoos they call them flashbacks, what do they call them in, in, in the art world? Like your, your, your little portfolio, it's yeah, a portfolio. Yeah, it's just a portfolio. You know, so I mean, just having your portfolio um, and showing kind of variations. I mean, if, if you have a strong style, then that's great, represent their style. But if you have yeah. the ability to kind of go across formats, that's really nice to show. Okay. Um, and I'm still, I think, you know, if you are looking or thinking to pitching to, to board game publishers, it's not only the art, but, you know, also if you can have that kind of uh, ability to demonstrate layout and um, the ability to s demonstrate iconography and some of the other aspects beyond just the art for the card. The art for the card or the pieces is important, but if you can be a one stop for you know, the entire graphical layout. So like my yeah. artists did everything. They did the map, they worked the icons for the dice, they did the, the, all the graphical choices and the icons for the cards that represent the actions. And the instructional um, the, book the bags, layout work the layout, and that sort of thing. Everything, you yeah. know. The the one artist did the cover, but the other artist 
did ever, and I mean, so as an example, all the art for the rolls was done by the same artist who did the layout for the cards, who did the icons, who did the map layout, um, all the detailing. So having a, a broad palette of being able to handle all the aspects that might go into a game yeah. pu uh, that's getting published, I think, is important. Okay. Um, and also, I wanted to ask, how do you um, go about designing your games? Is it uh, are you do you approach it more from like a mathematical standpoint, or are you really just tinkering? And I, I come from I come from a gut. Um, yeah. So, and, but there's very some people come from um, a, a, a mechanic standpoint where they're just yeah. they have some really balanced mechanics and they and they design from there. For me, I'm about kind of building and taking narrative and having it kind of immerse players and transcend what's happening so I start from a thematic place and say you know yeah. I want to make a game about the abolitionist movement so how do I make that come across how does that kind of transcend some cubes and some cards and so then it's a slow process of trial and error and bits by bits Right. and would you have any advice to a fellow board game designer who's considering coming to ALA for the first time uh, so I'm part of the we have the Games and Gaming Roundtable we are yeah. everything that is so you should be a part of the Games and Gaming um, Roundtable, yeah. it's a resource for everything that's happening, for support and all of that, but then we make things like the Gaming Lounge, the LA Play event, happen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, well, I hope you have a good ALA. Thanks so much for talking. Oh, I'm you. sorry. Where can we find your work online? I know uh, you said the board game is available through Amazon. Uh, do you have other things available on your personal site, social networks, and that sort of thing where we can check out upcoming games? Sure. Um, so mine's available through, yeah, you can get it on Amazon, any of the hobby game stores online. And it's it's Freedom. Freedom the Underground Railroad from yeah. Academy Games. And then I'm just working on other stuff. So this was my first design. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me.